Good morning. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Whatever the reason, his, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with his grinchy fingers, nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. The poor Grinch, he's isolated up on the mountain in his cave, but not so much so that he cannot hear the joy of Whoville just below. Too many of us can now relate after our many, many, many months of physical, physical distancing and quarantine. The Grinch is in a dark place and he thinks his only solution is to stop Christmas. And he assumes Christmas won't happen if he sneaks down to Whoville dressed like Santa Claus and steals all of the Christmas paraphernalia from all of the Who's. He takes all of their presents, all of their mistletoe wreaths, all of their little stockings. He cleans out their carefully stocked refrigerators. He even steals their Christmas trees. And and sweet little Cindy Lou who walks in on him stealing her family Christmas tree and she asks him with those big round blinky eyes, what are you doing? He lies and tells her some of the lights weren't working so he's going to fix them and then bring the tree back. But He had no intention of restoring Cindy Lou Who's family tree. He was as happy as he thought he could be. With all of the trappings of a classic Whoville Christmas loaded up in his fake sleigh and pulled back into the coldness of his cold, dark cave. In our Old Testament reading this morning, we read of a darkness that has been covering God's people. Thick Darkness is the way it is described to us, as if regular darkness wasn't enough. This darkness needed some heft to it, like crude oil caked with mud inching its way on the ground. Why so dark? Was it that the Israelites' shoes or sandals were too tight, or perhaps their hearts were too small? No, they're finally returning from exile, where life had been no fun at all. Some were taken far away and forced to learn to live in a foreign land with foreign people and their foreign ways. Others got to stay, but they were inundated with outsiders and their outsider ways and customs. The temple was destroyed and it felt like God was also destroyed in this devastation. How could they pray? How could they sing? How could they worship when everything was so wrong. This has not been an easy year for us by any stretch of anyone's imagination, right? We've, we've now lost 350,000 Americans to COVID-19 and 1.8 million people worldwide. We are, were also expected to lose nine million people to hunger and hunger-related illnesses in 2020. Given the number of job losses and the shrinking of the global economy, 2021 may be even more lethal. This is hard stuff. And the immediacy of our communication, it, it helps us stay connected to one another during this season of physical separation, but It also seems to highlight our differences in ways that make us even less tolerant of those who disagree with us about 
any number of things. We, we, we even made wearing a mask a political statement, an issue, when so far COVID-19 doesn't seem to care who you voted for when it infects your body. Families are stressed, companies are stressed, churches are stressed, communities are stressed. This is, this is a difficult time to be alive for those of us who are still fortunate enough to be alive. And yet we've, we've also seen some amazing things this year, right? We've, we've seen how a little creativity can go a long way in keeping us connected, in maintaining our worship, in keeping businesses going as people work from home, in sustaining our friendships and keeping up with one another. We invented drive-by parties. We've watched God's creation around us flourish as we take walks and gaze at the stars and the planets in the night sky. Some have discovered new hobbies and talents. Some have organized closets and rooms. Some have learned how valuable our teachers are to the lives and the learning of our children. And most of us have done the hard work to just keep going day after day after day after day into the Israelis' inky darkness, God tells them to look up. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you and driven the darkness from the land. This is such an inspiring passage of, of wonder and joy. The focus is on all of the nations, right? Seeing the light that is emanating from Israel and God's presence there. And, and they're drawn to it like moths to a candle. Not only are the nations coming to Israel, the, the lost sons and daughters are returning as well. All those who were sent away are now coming home. Kings will be so attracted to the light of Israel that they'll bring their own riches to share. It is a utopian picture painted by the prophet of glad reunion and glorious attention. Verse 5 says the Israelites will be so elated their hearts will throb and grow. It's as if everyone will be in love and their hearts will grow a few sizes bigger. That's what happened to the Grinch, right? He, he listened closely on Christmas morning to hear the wails and the gnashing of teeth from Whoville as they discovered Christmas had been canceled, but what he heard was different. It started low, then it started to grow, but the sound wasn't sad. Why, why this, this sound was merry. It couldn't be so, but it, it was merry. Very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or another, it came just the same. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It, it came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast and he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beef. <laughs> All is well in Whoville and the Grinch's heart grew just, just as the prophet predicted that the hearts of the Israelis would, Israelites would also grow when this glorious reunion occurred. 
But it didn't. It never happened. I mean, not, not like this. I mean, many of those who were in exile did return, but they weren't rich. They were just, they were just back. There weren't lines of camels stretching out to the horizon, packed with gold and frankincense. Well, then what did we miss? As Ulysses Everett McGill says in O Brother, Where Art Thou? It's a fool that looks for logic in the chambers of the human heart. Maybe this wasn't supposed to be a literal foretelling of future events. Perhaps, perhaps what the prophet is trying to describe is the condition of our hearts. When we come to realize God is in fact present, even in the thick darkness. Okay, if, if you tried to describe the joy that you felt on your most joyous day, how would you do it? Would you use hyperbole? Would you try to paint a word picture? Would you, would you use another event to try to help make your point? See, I, I think the prophet is trying to describe the unadulterated joy we experience when we look up from the darkness. I also think the prophet is trying to cast a vision for what Israel was always intended to be, a beacon of God's love for the rest of the world. And, and if we start counting camels, well, we will miss the point entirely. And I'm confident that happened in post-exilic communities, right? People are people. There had to be many who kept wondering when this great windfall was going to come to the nation. But what the prophet was trying to say is God's presence is with the people. And eternally more important than the condition of any nation is the condition of the people's hearts. Are they growing like the Grinch's heart during his great epiphany about Christmas? Or are they still small, assuming God's presence is going to shower them with presents? What about us? Are we waiting bitterly for God's presence in our life to manifest itself in some form of wealth or success or wish fulfillment? Are we looking around in the dark for our pot of gold that will make our lives so much easier to live? The, the light that is supposed to attract all the nations is not the glimmer of gold or the glitz and the glamour of fame. It is the light of the world. And we see it again in the form of a baby. Born to poor parents from a little nothing town in the middle of nowhere. Even the, the magi, right? The ones whom we remember on this day, they came to meet a king, but they left defying the orders of the king because, because they'd met God. It, it's not their gifts that confirm the majesty of this child. It's the change in the hearts of those who saw him. Without getting too evangelical, Dr. Seuss was making a powerful point about Christmas. That it's being more than the trappings and the lights and the boxes tied up with string. It is, of course, about the incarnation of God in the birth of Jesus. The, the light of the world who then conferred that title on us. Just as the prophet tried to communicate to the people of Israel long ago, God's light doesn't just shine on you, it, it transforms you into a light bearer yourself. And the light you bear is, is God's light shining through you to attract others to come out of the darkness and to also be transformed. As a church community, we've, we've lived the joy of people being drawn to the light of Christ in our church and, and joining us in this journey. And it is a treasure that comes from a faraway place or from next door. When, when people give us the gift 
of sharing their lives in this covenant relationship in which we live at Seventh, we are overwhelmed with joy. It's as if the abundance of the sea washed up on our shores, like Isaiah says. But if we stand around looking for a school of fish, we, we miss the treasure. We, we miss the point. Our hearts will throb and grow when we see God's light shining through the thick darkness. And then our own light will shine because it's, it's God's light through us. It's God's glory. It is God's surprising presence among us. And it's beautiful. It's love. Love that will not be driven away by a season of separation. Love that will survive and grow and drive out the darkness in our hearts and the darkness that lies between us. It's love that will guide us to care for one another and for our neighbors with creativity and tenacity as we embark on this new calendar year together. It is love. And it echoes into eternity. Friends, look, look up. Look around. Though the darkness is real and painful, though it is often thick with despair, it stands no chance against the light of God. So look up, look around and see God's light and feel God's love and then be radiant with it as you go boldly into this next season of life and whatever it may bring. Amen. Beloved, may your hearts be enlarged by the reality of God's presence in your life this day and for all the days to come. So go glowing with God's love until we can be together again. Amen.